Today's video is sponsored by Veloy. Over the years, I've done a number of scanning videos on this channel as I've searched for better quality in a process that fits me best. From an Epson V500 to a V4990 to a Nikon CoolScan 9000, and now to what I would consider my favorite and also long-term solution, camera scanning with a GFX 50R. And earlier this year, I shared a little bit of that journey as I went from the cool scan, dabbling with camera scanning, and then to the GFX. But I really wanted to make this video now that I have everything like locked down and dialed in uh, with a final process that I'm really happy with, just to share uh, like the tools, techniques, settings that work best for me, just in hopes that maybe you take something away from this that can help you with your own workflow. So in this video today, we're gonna to scan a roll of film and go through everything, starting with the specific gear and accessories I use to the technique and camera settings, how I convert and process the negatives, and finally, how I organize and store it all. And also, this is likely going to be like a longer video. I'm gonna try my best to keep it moving, but I will put timestamps below if you wanna to jump to specific sections that interest you. And then I will also put uh, links to gear and accessories, anything I mention uh, below as well if you're interested in those. So first up, we'll start with the camera. And I started out using the GFX 100S. Now I've kind of downgraded to the 50R. I did a video about this camera recently and a bunch of you have reached out and asked if I've been as happy with this or scanning as I was with the 100S. And I would say absolutely yes. The only difference to me, you know, Color and quality seem identical. It just comes down to resolution. So, you know, the 100S is like a 12,000 pixel wide image. This is like an 8,000 pixel wide. I would let that be the determining factor if you're interested in either of these to use kind of dual purpose. And the reason that I've chose to go the camera scanning route uh, with the GFX versus like a full frame or an APS-C, there's lots of other great options out there, uh, is just the fact that, as I mentioned, dual purpose, I also use this camera as a photography camera. And it's one that I enjoy quite a bit and use a lot. So it also helps kind of justify the investment. Okay, so next up is lens. There was no way I was gonna invest like 2000 pounds or whatever it is in the Fuji 120 macro because I would only use it for this. So I am using the Pentax 645 120 F4 macro. This is from their older 645 film camera system. I think I paid like $200 for this. It's really affordable and I found it to be uh, incredibly sharp edge to edge, really nice lens. Obviously coverage is great. So uh, I would highly recommend this for anyone who is thinking about using a GFX. And then when it comes to adapter, I am using this one from Photo Deox. This is the Photo Deox Pro, but I started out with this adapter from Kipon. And the build and the fit of the Kipon is quite a bit nicer than the Photo Deox. But what I like about this is just the fact that it has this built-in uh, tripod foot, this Arca Swiss uh, quick release plate on it. So what I'll do is I'll mount the lens and then I will leave the lens and the adapter mounted to the copy stand with a quick release plate. So it just lives over there at all times. And what's really nice is when I wanna scan, if I've been shooting with the GFX, I can just come up, mount the camera body. And then when I'm done, I can detach the camera body and just put a cap on. So I basically have this like permanent solution that's sitting there waiting. So I would recommend, you know, even if you aren't shooting with the GFX, try and find some sort of adapter that has this uh, tripod foot quick release plate on it, or even look into uh, a lens collar if you aren't adapting lenses, that'll do the same thing. It's just really nice to have this like permanent stationary solution uh, that is ready to go at all times. Okay, so next up is this Beloy unit that I use. Beloy has actually come on as a new sponsor of this channel, but I've featured their stuff in some previous videos. I'm a big fan of all these accessories that they make. And obviously, when you're camera scanning, you need something that's gonna hold your film flat and act as a bit of a mask. Uh, Veloy make a number of accessories that do just that, and then they offer kits as well. So I have their complete kit, and basically this is the advancer unit, the light holder, a diffusion panel in between, and then a number of different film holders. So this is a 120 film holder, I have a 35 as well, and then you get these masks as well. But What's been so nice about this is it basically, again, gives me this permanent solution that lives over there on the copy stand, and I can take a complete roll of film that's uncut, 
load it in and basically advance frame by frame. And as you'll see after, you can fly through a roll in like a minute or two. So this has just been so nice to use and kind of been one of the things that's uh, sold me on camera scanning. Something like this, their complete unit, is more of an investment. So uh, if you are just looking to get into this and like experiment and dabble a little bit, you can buy, I'm pretty sure all these accessories separate. So you could just pick up one of their film holders. I think this is like, you know, 35 pounds for a 120 holder. And then you could just put this on top of some sort of light or a light pad and you'd be good to go. I have something that holds your film nice and flat. So great stuff. I've been a big fan of uh, the accessories they make and they actually offered anyone who watches this channel 10% off any of their items. So I'll put a either a link or a code below if you wanna check some of this stuff out. Okay, so next up is the light that I'm using. This is by a company called Relano. This is a PLV-S116. And this has been great. I've had this right from the start. And the reason is, is because that is what the Veloy holder is made for. This actually came with the kit. You can buy this separate though. It's a very affordable panel. And uh, the cool thing is that it, I think it has a claimed CRI of 95. So really great color rendering for a cheaper panel quality and color in my conversions. I've always been very happy with. I haven't tried any others, but I would definitely recommend this. And I think they have actually released an updated version of this model with just like some new dials and stuff. But the nice upgrade is you can actually run it off of wall power, which is a great update just because uh, there's been so many times where I've gone to use this and have forgotten to charge it. It just has an internal battery and it ends up being dead. And then I have to sit and wait for like an hour or two how well this charges before I can scan. So anyways, this has been nice and I would definitely recommend checking this one out. Okay, last thing to talk about is a copy stand. I'm gonna go grab that in a second, but the stand that I was using and it was in my previous video was by a company called NovaFlex. It was really nice, super solid. It actually just clamped onto the desk and I liked it quite a bit. The only issue that I ran into is that it was just a little bit short to the point where I couldn't get the GFX and the 120 high enough to scan six by seven. So I had to build like a little bit of a contraption to raise the camera up a bit, which worked. But in the end, I just decided that I wasn't a fan of having like extra pieces involved that could potentially introduce flex to the unit. So I ended up buying a ridiculously gigantic overkill beast of a stand. I'll go grab it now and show you it if I can even fit it here in frame. So this <laughs> is the Kaiser RS1 stand with an RA1 arm. And this thing, like I said, is massive. It is overkill, but I absolutely love it. It's not a cheap stand. I think these are like 600 pounds new. And the only reason that I bought this one is because I found a really great deal on Facebook Marketplace for like a third of what they go for new. But it's really nice, super solid. I love this base plate. It has this geared crank here to adjust the height. And then I've added, like I said, a quick release Arca Swiss plate here. I'll link to this. This is just off Amazon. So I can just leave that lens adapter clamped in. So this has been great. Kaiser makes an RS2, which is this, but smaller. I've never used it, but that could definitely be maybe a, a better solution if you don't need this tank of a stand. But the cool thing is shortly after I bought the stand from NovaFlex, Veloy actually hooked up with NovaFlex and got them to build that same stand for Veloy, but just modified so it's actually 13 centimeters, I think 13 centimeters taller. So basically fixes that problem. And you know, if you're shooting full frame or APS-C, definitely high enough and probably now even GFX with a longer lens, you'd be able to get the height you need. So um, I think that's a great option as well, having that modified stand. But um, anyways, that's the accessories and gear I use. I'm gonna put this all back together over there and we'll jump over to the workbench and scan some film. Okay, got everything put back together. We're gonna jump into this scanner roll of film. And the first thing that I always start with, even if it's only been like a day, is I go and I check to make sure that the camera and the film holder are level or are basically parallel and aligned properly. And to do that, uh, you just use a mirror. The kit that I got came with a mirror from Veloy. Obviously you can just use any mirror if you want. And the idea is you just put this on top of your film holder and I put the center point on my screen right in the middle. And what you wanna do is you wanna focus on your iris and then you just wanna 
line it up so it's right in the center of the frame. And to do that, to go back and forth or left and right, I'll just actually uh, shift the camera itself because it's just always like these micro adjustments. But uh, the Voloi unit has these little rubber adjustable feet if you want to go back uh, or forward or left or right as well. So the idea, regardless of how you do it, is just to make sure that the iris of your lens is dead center in the frame of your camera. And when it is, you know that these two things are aligned properly. But we will get into this roll. So I'm gonna load up some Ektar here. And when I load this in, obviously you wanna use, if you're using the Advancer, you wanna use a full uncut roll because that's how you can take advantage of like the speed of this thing. I always load my film in right side up. Some people sh say you should put shiny side down just because uh, if it's up, you risk potentially like getting reflections from stray light. But whenever I do this, I shut off all the lights anyways. Obviously today filming this, I'm gonna leave the lights on so you can see, and then I'll shut them off and scan this for the images we look at. But I've always been going shiny side up. And I've never had any issues whatsoever with reflections. So that is what we will stick with. And I have just a, the uh, six by seven mat in here right now. Okay, so we're good to go there. Camera settings uh, on the GFX, I use automatic mode, which becomes aperture priority with a manual lens. Two thirds of a stop of overexposure, which is what uh, Negative Lab Pro recommends. And then shooting raw, obviously lossless compressed. White balance is set to uh, 5600 Kelvin because this panel is a daylight panel. And again, though, shooting raw, going to white balance off the film border anyways. And then I have the shutter on the Fuji set to electronic shutter just to avoid any type of camera shake. And then I have peaking turned on because obviously we're going to be manual focusing. And I use uh, white and strong for the, uh, the Fuji settings, which I'll show you. And then I am actually using Fuji's camera remote app. So it's basically just this little Bluetooth trigger allows me to keep my hands off the camera and not have to use um, like a, a self timer either. So those are the settings, super straightforward. And we'll go ahead now and start scanning this. And like I said, I'm gonna leave this light on just so you can see what I'm doing. But what I always do when I'm using this advancer, usually the first frame, once you get it aligned in the film, just will be a little short of catching. So I'll go ahead and I'll focus on this frame and shoot this one. And to do that, I open up my iris wide open and then I zoom into 100%. And then I basically just find a place in the frame where there's some peaking and I focus until it's kind of most intense or sharpest. And then I'll zoom out and I close down. And on this lens, I shoot this at F8. Just after doing some tests, I found that to be the, the kind of perfect sweet spot of sharpness and depth of field. And then usually I'll give these a little blow with a rocket blower. I'll probably do that for every frame, but for this demonstration, I won't just to keep things moving. So go ahead and shoot this. So now what I'll do is I'll go and I'll just give this a little bit of a push to feed into the advancer unit. I'll go to the second frame. And now once it's kind of into the advancer unit, for the second frame, I'll go and I'll just double check my focus again. And my idea is just, you know, maybe something shifted ever so slightly when that film got pulled into the advancer unit. But basically from here on out, I'll leave the focus set until I get to the end of the roll and I'll show you. So we'll just go ahead and we'll blast through these real quick. And I think I'll probably just let this, I may speed this up in the edit, but I might just let it play out so you can get a feel for how nice and quick this can be. And like I said, I would usually, I would probably be giving these like a quick little uh, dust in between, but so you can see what I'm doing, we're just gonna leave it. Okay, a couple more here. So coming up to the last frame, what I do is the same thing I did with the first frame. I'll just go and I usually just double check and make
make sure my focus is good. And, you know, my thinking is, since the film isn't overhanging off here, maybe this shifted a little bit for the last frame. So I just want to be sure that it's good to go. And that's it. So, I, I mean, super quick. And really that is one of the big things that made me kind of fall in love with camera scanning. I loved the CoolScan 9000. The results are amazing and it's so simple to use. But honestly, the amount of time that that took would probably be like one frame at highest quality setting on the cool scan. So uh, it's just like actually made me want to scan. You know, when I get a roll of film back now from the lab, it's nice to know I can just come over here and go through this process really quick and then have my images on the computer in no time. Uh, and then what I'll do is I just leave these rolls once I'm done. Um, I won't cut them yet because my thinking is I wanna take them over to the computer first and I wanna load these on and process uh, or convert and process them and just make sure that everything was fine and I didn't like miss focus or anything. Uh, because, you know, obviously once you cut these into strips, you can still scan them just fine, but you do lose the ability to do that whole roll really quickly. So I leave these, I go and convert and process. Once I feel really confident with them, then I'll go and cut and sleeve them, which we'll do after. But um, right now, let's take these or I'll rescan them with a the light off. Let's take these after that and we'll go and convert them. Okay, so it's gonna import and convert all these images now. So in the past I did a video about my like organization and naming workflow. I'm not gonna go too in depth, but I will say my process has changed quite a bit. Just really simplifying it. In the past I was doing like date and location and having all these subfolders specific for those. But all that I do now is if we pull up this card, I use Lightroom to, to import the images onto my actual hard, uh, hard drive. So I would do destination uh, into subfolder and on my main photography drive, I just have this image files folder and then I would have image files 2022. And then I let Lightroom make a subfolder uh, whenever it imports something, which is basically just the date. Super simple. I just basically know that all of my images that I've scanned or shot are gonna be in that 2022 folder. And then I would do add to collection. In Lightroom, I have projects that are basically finished under collections. And then I have uh, working projects. Some of these are ones that I feel pretty clear on. I'll have folders like this where it's just like England miscellaneous where it's like, I don't really know what these are for yet. So I'm doing all of my organizing in Lightroom. And obviously for this one, I'm gonna go under YouTube and I have a GFX 50R scanning uh, collection here. And then the only other thing I'm doing is I'm renaming the files. I'm using Lightroom to, to rename these when they import. And I use custom name and original file number. And all that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add the name of the film. So this is Ektar, we put that in there and it'll give me this unique file name that's basically Ektar. And in this case, 6404, which is uh, the, the file number, the original Fuji file number. So very simple, like I said in the past, I had all these different dates and names for file names and I'm just like, it became a little bit complicated. And since I'm using Lightroom to do all of my organizing and using collections, all I really need is unique file names and a, a place where I know it all lives on my hard drive. So we'll go ahead and import these. And then obviously using Lightroom and Negative Lab Pro, so we'll, show you how I do the conversion here. We'll convert one of these images. I'll just show you basically my workflow. We're not gonna do them all because it'll basically just be the same thing over and over. So we'll go ahead and do this first one. But what I always do is you gotta prep these obviously before you go and convert them. So go and pick the Negative Lab Pro profile. And then Lightroom will set some default settings that I don't want on. I don't want any like lens corrections or remove chromatic aberration. Uh, I turn sharpening off. And then especially this, Lightroom will default to adding color noise reduction, which if you're shooting color film can actually uh, be a problem. There's been some negatives I've done in the past where uh, this has been left on and you can actually go and change it afterwards once the conversion has been done and you'll see that it, it will take away some saturation of colors. So definitely make sure to turn that off. And then gonna white balance and crop, but before I do that, because I wanna do that unique for each image, I'll just go and copy those settings. And then I would go for every image on the roll and just paste that. So uh, basically each one of these images is getting no sharpening, no uh, noise reduction, and it's getting that negative lab pro profile applied. 
But for this video, we'll just do this one. So what I would do now is I would go and white balance first off of the film border. And then I usually, with these raw files, I'll just go and crop in and I'll leave a bit of the film border because these are kind of like my master files. And if I end up liking the image and it looks like it has potential, then what I would do is I would export a TIFF and work off of that. So go Control N. I leave mine set to uh, basic for color mode in Negative Lab Pro. I don't want it during conversion changing any colors in a, I guess, like a creative way. So I just leave mine set to basic, pre-saturation set to just the default, and then border buffer. If I include film borders, uh, in this case, I would leave it to 5%. And basically negative lab pro is just going to uh, do its conversion based off of a smaller portion of the frame. So it doesn't take into account those borders. And then under advanced, always good to check if you're gonna be making like a, a positive copy afterwards. I want a TIFF, I also want 16-bit, and I want to be in Adobe RGB, not sRGB. So good to check those settings as well. And same with this one, including collections. That way, if you are working in a collection, when you create that positive, it will put it in the collection. You won't have to go out of the collection and bring it back in. But let's go ahead and convert this one. So this is Ektar, which is always weird. I find it always needs um, some work to get looking normal, which this one definitely will. I find Negative Lab Pro, uh, for me, it's the conversion software that does the best job right out of the gate. This one needs some work, but the other software I've used, I always find I have to do a lot to get the image looking nice. Uh, but what I always usually end up with is Lab Soft. I don't wanna bake too much into these images right away. So usually I'm just going Lab Soft. I'll make some you know brightness adjustments if I feel like it needs it. And then I'm just going in to fix any color cast. And 90% of the time I can do that using these temp and tint adjustments. Hectar might need a little bit more than that. This one actually isn't looking too bad. I would probably go into the shadows and take a little bit of the blue out. And then it defaults on mine at least to uh, applying this frontier LUT. I either go between that or none. And it really is just image dependent. But in this image, Frontier actually looks quite nice. So as this image is right now, I like how this looks. It's a little bit too saturated, but it's an image I like enough that I would make a copy. I would turn sharpening off, even though we have no sharpening applied, and I would hit apply. So my thinking is, you know, I like this image, I'll make a TIFF, and that TIFF is, will be the one that I work off of. So I have this one now, and now I would go and I would make my like saturation and tonal adjustments and I would sharpen this. And the, the problem I had in the past is I was sharpening these raw files and then when I would make a TIFF out of them, it would bake that sharpening in. So if I ever wanted to go and, um, you know, if I was working on the TIFF and I ever wanted to change the sharpening, I'd have to go back to the raw file and make another one. So now I just end up doing all my sharpening on this final image. And we'll go and do that right now. And when it comes to sharpening, this is really gonna be dependent per on personal preference, on output and on uh, resolution and the lens that you've used. I find with the GFX, I almost always end up with a radius around two. Usually a high resolution image needs a higher radius. And then I'll just kind of sharpen to eye. Knowing that I can always go back and change this, but my idea is to have something that's just nice, not overdone, and will allow me room, like flexibility, if I wanna go and bring this into Photoshop to make a print. And then if I were gonna stick with this image, I would go and I'd probably now crop out these film borders. I would just use a four by five crop, because this was shot on a six, seven camera. And I would make a few saturation adjustments and stuff like that. So I won't, you know, finish this one off, it's not really the point of this video, but that is how kind of I use Negative Lab Pro and my workflow. And then the only other thing I would do is I would go out of this collection knowing that I like this image. And I would go and delete this raw file. Not from my disk, I would just remove it from Lightroom. And then I end up just with this one here. There is a duplicate for some reason. I don't know why. So we'll get rid of that. So the point is I end up with this image I like and I have this TIFF file 
and that's what I work from. Okay, last but not least, going to just talk very quickly about organization. So I am using still these Best File archival binders. These are like hard-sided plastic. And these are oversized as well. So these fit the 120-4UB print file sheets. Let's see if I can find one in here. So these ones right here, and these are nice because if you're shooting six, seven, you can basically cut yours into two, three, three, two, and it'll fit uh, an entire roll of six, seven. The regular 120 sheets are a little too narrow. So these ones are great to get. I'll put a link for both of this stuff below. And then just using this Mastin film cutter. I featured this in a video a while ago, just about accessories that I like. Uh, but this is great because you just feed the film in and then use this guillotine to chop it. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and show you how to do the whole roll, but uh, this thing is very nice because it has a little advancing wheel. It just gives you like a nice clean cut. So you go get your two. And then since this is six, seven, the next one I would do is three. And so on. So, I mean, obviously you can use scissors for this as well. This thing isn't, it's not expensive, but it's also not cheap. But this is just really nice if you care about getting nice clean cuts and having something that's pretty easy to use. So that is basically my entire workflow. And I wanted to share this, just like I said before, I think really what's most important with scanning at home is to really kind of nail a process and have a place for everything, just so everything's streamlined. You know, when you get your film back from development or when you develop it yourself, everything's ready to go. You scan it, you do these certain things and you file it away and it's good. It took me a long time to get to this point and there were a lot of like in-betweens where things would get really messy and unorganized. So um, it's felt great now to have like a really solid, simple, efficient process in place. So uh, anyways, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you take something away from it. If it's gear, if it's process or technique or anything like that. Like I said before, you know, this isn't the only way to do things. It's what works for me and uh, I've been very happy with it. So anyways, Hope you enjoyed this. As always, thank you for watching and I'll talk to you soon.